Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks you all for being here and participating in today's CISA IFPU webinar, webinar on gravity. Today with us, we have uh, Claire Barrage. Claire is currently professor at the University of Nottingham. She has had a vast experience in particle physics and theoretical cosmology, as seen in the numerous citations and articles published in, the, in prestigious scientific journals. Through her academic years, she has been dedicated to the study of different topics. For instance, combining astrophysical observation with atomic techniques, astrophysical tests of dark energy, a study of cosmology within modifying gravity, especially model with actions, galileons, chameleons, and screen mechanisms in general. She got her PhD in physics from the University of Cambridge. Afterward, she moved to DESI in 2008 and as a hub of doctoral research, and then to the University of Geneva. Since 2013, she, was, she has been working at the University of Nottingham. She has received multiple awards, for as for example, the Royal Society Research Fellowship and the Institute of Physics Maxwell Prize. Thanks a lot, Claire, to accept it to accept it, uh, our invitation to our webinars. Please uh, switch off the microphone and go ahead. Claire. Oh, thank you very oh, much. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm getting a huge amount of feedback from somebody. Okay, that's better. Um, thanks very much for having me. It's um, it's lovely to be here. It's sort of nice that it's um, it's easy to travel to you in Italy from the comfort of my own home. Um, but you know, it would obviously be very nice to, to see you in person. Um, so yes, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, our series of modified gravity, particularly I'm going to be interested in scalar tensor modifications of gravity. Um, and so you can see uh, a little outline of the talk here. The, the introduction is going to start, we're going to motivate why we're interested in adding scalar fields into our theory of gravity. Um, and then we're immediately going to encounter a problem, which is that if we add those scalar fields in, then generally you would expect to see, to see their phenomenology already. So I'm going to talk about two possible ways to, to get around that. Why haven't we seen a fifth force mediated by these, these scalar fields already? Um, and these are the ideas of, of scalar invariance in your theory and, and screening the fifth forces through nonlinearities. Now, some of you might be familiar with these concepts already. Um, but if you're not, I'm going to introduce them as we go along. So hopefully that will be okay for everyone. And the kind of underlying theme of my talk is going to be, you know, we have a huge, we're going to see that there's a lot of motivation to try and do this, to try and study these theories, to understand if they can, um, if they can explain our universe or not. Um, but it's actually really difficult to put them on a, a really rigorous footing from a, a sort of quantum theory point of view to understand them in the same way that we understand particle physics theories. Um, can we build good effective theories? Can we understand what happens to these theories at, at high energies? And so that's going to be the, the theme that I keep coming back to is how do we build these models that have the behavior that we want them to have um, in, in ways that, that are robust from a theoretical point of view. Um, and, and to give away kind of the, the punchline, the ending of my talk, um, there's going to be, there isn't going to be a grand thesis. The, the, the conclusion is going to be just that it's difficult. Um, so I'm going to talk you through um, a couple of examples of how to do this. And we're going to see the kinds of problems we run into. But I certainly don't have a, um, a fully synthesized thesis about why things are hard, in, in what way they're hard, um, or, or if this is, um, if this is a no go or if there's there's a way um, of getting around it but hopefully in building up these these examples we'll sort of see the, the types of things we have to worry about and where they might come into play um, for future work okay so that's to give you the the scope of of what i'm going to try and tell you in the next 50 minutes um please do interrupt if anything is not clear please please ask me um because i'd, I'd much rather be clear and not say everything than, than get through everything and not have made any sense to anyone hopefully that's okay Okay, so, so the motivation for, the, a lot of the motivation for thinking about modified theories of gravity comes from the fact that we don't have a good understanding of what our universe is doing on the very largest scales. So this is, um, this slide is showing you a little bit of a summary of our picture of the contents of the universe. 
So in the um, image on the top left, you can see our cosmological data being put together to tell us how much of our universe today is made up of something that looks like matter, that's the fraction on the horizontal axis, and something that looks like a cosmological constant, that's the fraction on the vertical axis. And the, the data are, are now at the level where they can tell us to, to a very high degree of precision that we need a substantial component of our universe to be made of something that looks like a cosmological constant. Um, and that's great. That's a huge improvement over not very many decades ago. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, it opens a lot of, of questions about, um, you know, what is the nature of this cosmological constant? Is it really a constant? Why does it have the value that it has? All of these things are, are still open questions that, that we don't have good answers to, either from the theoretical side or from the observational side. Because as soon as we start interrogating our data a little bit further, and we start asking some of these questions, like is, is the cosmological constant actually a constant? Can you tell? Um, so the plot on the, on the bottom right in this slide um, comes from the Planck collaboration and is asking, well, if the equation of state of this component, can we tell if it's constant or does it evolve with the scale factor of the universe? That's this one, the, the A in this expression here. And you can see that whilst the, the data are certainly consistent with no evolution, that would be WA equals zero, um, there's a big degeneracy here. This is not something that we can pin down with, with the current data very well. So there's scope from, from the observational side to ask questions. There's space here for us to ask questions about what is the nature of dark energy. There's certainly room for it to be something um, more dynamic than a pure cosmological constant um, and given that we don't understand the, the nature of a constant solution I think that's that that's certainly something that is worth investigating um, further. Um, now as we try and, and understand what this component is this dark energy in our universe or as we try and solve the cosmological constant problem um, we, there are lots of theories that people have proposed I guess that's the first thing to say um, and I think it's also fair to say that there's no consensus amongst the theoretical community about what is the right solution to the cosmological constant. And I think in this way, dark energy is really different. Understanding dark energy is really different to understanding dark matter. In dark matter, in the case of dark matter, we have a number of theories which are all pretty consistent with observations. And now we just need to interrogate the data to find out which one is right. Um, the status of the dark energy and the cosmological constant problem, I think, is different in that we're still really struggling to build good, consistent models that explain these problems, explain what our universe is doing, that are kind of fully theoretically consistent and compatible with all of our observational data. But nevertheless, we keep trying um, and um, there's sort of some generic features or some, some common features that crop up in, in many of our attempts to, to modify uh, our theory to explain the accelerated expansion of our universe. Um, sometimes people do a classification where they say, okay, well, I can modify either the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the Einstein equations. I could add new matter into my universe or I could modify my theory of gravity. Now, that's, a, a, that's not a sharp distinction. There's, there's a fuzzy boundary in the middle because often you can map one of those theories into another and we'll see an example of that in a moment. Um, but a common feature, whatever approach you take to, to changing your theory to, to, um, to explain what our universe is doing, is that we end up introducing um, new light degrees of freedom. Okay, either, either directly, as if you say there are a quintessence state field rolling in some potential, that's what's driving my accelerated expansion, or sort of more indirectly, because you've gone in and you've modified your theory of gravity to explain uh, why the universe is behaving as it is on large scales, um, and then as a consequence of that, you've got a, an extra scalar degree of freedom in your gravitational sector. And so fundamentally, whatever your motivation for, for studying this is, um, or whatever your thought process was to building your, your theory, your modified theory, is that you've got a new, de new, new degree, to, yeah, you've got new degrees of freedom in your theory and they're scalars. And so whilst we're still trying to sort of take a top-down approach to solving this problem, I think it's also interesting to start from the idea of um, what well, new scalar degrees of freedom are interesting. They're, they're a common feature. So I can ignore exactly the precise model in the kind of full uh, unified theory of physics from which they come from. 
and just ask what is allowed for light scalar fields in, in, in our universe? Are they, can, can I build sensible models? Can I build sensible models that are compatible with our observations? Um, and that's the, the, the question that I'm going to try and explore uh, in this talk. So we're going to talk about scalar fields. The motivation for studying them is going to be coming from dark energy and the cosmological constant problem largely. Um, but for most of the rest of the talk, I'm actually not going to talk about cosmological solutions. I'm going to talk about how we build theories of um, gravity and of uh, a standard models of, of particle, how we build models of gravity and particle physics with extra scalars in um, that, that behave in, in the way that we want. Okay, hopefully that's clear. So what's, what happens when we introduce new scalar field, fields into our theory? So the, the questions are where in your action do you put your scalar field? Um, and this is, this is a, a simple example of trying to do that. This is one of the simplest examples actually. For, oh, for some reason the reference has fallen off this slide, but um, the, these, the, there's a long history of doing this, so we'll going back to, to Jordan and, and Brand Sticky. Um, so you could introduce your scalar field, as we said, as a modification of gravity. So maybe now you've set, you've made, as, as we're doing in the first line here, the Planck mass is no longer fixed. Um, we allow it to evolve and we call that a scalar field. Um, or maybe you want to add your scalar field into the matter sector. You want it to interact with, with your matter fermions, that's the psi here. And you want to leave the Einstein Hilbert tensor alone. Okay, Those are, this is what we've been talking about. Maybe you can modify gravity, maybe you can modify the matter content of your theory. But in fact, these two theories are exactly related to one another by a general rescaling of the metric. So you just rescale um, your, your bare metric with some function of the scalar field uh, to give you a tilde metric, and these two theories are exactly mapped one to the other. Okay. So um, in order to do calculations, we're going to have to make one or the other of these choices. Typically, I'm always going to choose that the scalar field couples explicitly to, to matter. So I'm going to generally make a choice where um, the Einstein-Hilbert uh, term in our action is, uh, is the standard one and our scalar field is interacting with matter and we're going to talk about fifth forces and coupling to matter. But it's important to remember that, that this is still a, a modified gravity theory. I could e equivalently rewrite my theory um, with no coupling to matter and, uh, and a modified gravity term in our action, and I would get exactly the same physics out. Okay, all, all we're doing here is just field redefinitions, and that doesn't doesn't change the physics. Okay. So these are, our, these are two, the two pictures we can look at, Jordan and Einstein frame. Einstein frame where gravity works sort of as in GR and Jordan frame where there is no interaction between the scalar field and matter. Um, and you can, so this is again saying in words the point I just made that in the Einstein frame, because we have an explicit coupling between our scalar field and matter fields, those matter fields don't necessarily move on geodesics of our space-time metric because they're experiencing an extra fifth force due to our scalar field. Whereas in the Jordan frame, our matter fields are moving on geodesics, but they're geodesics of a metric which now depends on a spin zero and a spin two field. Okay? At the end of the day, the point that we want to make is however you interpret this, um, the, the phenomenology and the observables that you get are the same. Okay. So this is the gravitational picture that we, we've been talking about. You can also think about this from a particle physics point of view. Um, and again, you're going to get the same answer because physics doesn't really care how we do our calculations. Um, but you could think if we're talking about scalars interacting with matter particles, you could think about um, uh, our, our matter fermions here. They're the solid lines and they interact by exchanging a virtual scalar in an S-channel diagram. And you can do all your Feynman diagram calculations and get um, the Yukawa interact. You, you get the form of the interaction between these two matter particles, and it has um, the form that you would probably expect, which is a Yukawa interaction. So the type of thing we're expecting to see here is so this this depends on the masses of our two particles. Um, it depends on the strength of the coupling to matter. So we've normalised this to the new to the gravitational strength here. There's a one-eye graph all off with distance, um, just as you expect for Newtonian force laws. 
and then potentially an exponential suppression as well if our field has a mass. So at some point you go beyond the Compton wavelength of your scalar field and it becomes exponentially difficult to, to transmit information. Okay, so we've got three pictures here um, which are all telling us about the same physics and which one we're going to pick is going to just depend on what we think is the most useful way, what is the easiest way to calculate the thing that we're interested in. And I'm going to switch between them a little bit as we go through this talk. So I kind of want to set them up from the beginning. Um, there is no, there, there really is no magic in the fact that I'm switching between them and I'll pick a different one for a different problem because at the end of the day, the observables don't care about the way in which we do the calculation. It's just what is, what is easier to, to can do the computation we want. Okay. Now, sorry. <clears throat> the theories I've been talking to you about so far have been quite straightforward ones. The brand sticky theory and uh, a standard Yukawa type um, scalar interaction between matter particles. Now, if we take the interaction of our our matter particles, and if our theory is linear, then if I've computed the interaction between two fundamental particles, and I want to compute uh, the force between two macroscopic objects like the Earth and the Moon, all I do is sum up all of those particle level interactions, and now I have the same um, interaction potential, but now the masses that I'm interested in are the mass of the Earth and the Moon rather than like the mass of two electrons. Similarly, if, if what I'm interested in is, um, is, is a simple theory of modified gravity where I've just introduced the lowest order terms that I can for my scalar field, again, I get this kind of Yukawa type interaction. And this is very easy, well, it's not easy to constrain, I shouldn't say that, our experimental colleagues have worked very hard, um, but it can be constrained and people have been trying to do this for a long time. Um, and they've been looking on all sorts of length scales and the constraints are extremely good. Um, you can say this, this is going from um, terrestrial scales on the left hand side of the plot through solar system scales on the, on the right. Um, and on all of these scales, our scalar field has to be interacting more weakly than gravity. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So it looks like this kind of modification is very constrained. If, our scalar, if we introduce our scalar, it interacts with matter, it looks like we already have really tight bounds. Okay, these, <coughs> excuse me, the strength of this interaction being weaker than gravity means that we've put an energy scale in our problem, which is above the Planck scale, which is not very satisfying um, from, from the point of view of building sensible theories and feels like yet another fine tuning in our, in our cosmological model. So what, what do we do here? We've sort of got this motivation from cosmology to introduce these light scalars and yet um, our observations are telling us that they're really, really constrained. So this is where the two parts of my talk are going to come in. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is whether actually we need to worry about these scalar fields interacting with matter. Maybe we can just forbid that altogether. Um, and we can, we're going to do that with, with, um, with a scalar variance, which I'm going to talk, explain in a moment. The second part of the talk is going to be talking about screening mechanisms, which are kind of commonly discussed in, in theories of modified gravity, the way of hiding um, our first force. So that's just to say that that's, we're going to come to that, but I'm going to talk about scale invariance first. Now, the idea of, of scale invariant theories of modified gravity has a, has a very long history, and I sort of tried to highlight some of the, the key uh, references in the, on this slide, but this is certainly not a comprehensive list. A lot of people have thought about this. I don't want to claim that this is a, a original to us. Um, and the, the point is, we, we're talking here, the, the type of coupling to matter that we've been talking about is one where the scale field couples universally, um, it couples to all matter in the same way, and it's a conformal cap coupling, meaning, meaning that all it does is just, it's, you can think about it as, um, uh, as, as rescaling all of your distance scales, all of your energy scales in the same way. Now, if I don't have any fixed scales in my problem, um, if, if I were just talking about pure gravity, then this wouldn't, this, this wouldn't make any observable changes. Um, the, the reason that we see the effects of this scalar field is because we have 
hard scales in our problem. Uh, and those hard scales can, well, if we're talking about sort of planetary, then we, we have fixed distances between planets, we have fixed masses of planets. If we're thinking about this on a particle physics scale, so a slightly more fundamental scale, everything boils down to the fact that the particles have hard masses, and those all boil down to the fact, fundamentally, that, that the, the fixed scale in the standard model is, in fact, the Higgs mass, and everything else comes, comes from there. So we're going to think about how our scalar field interacts with, with the Higgs. And this is the, the one scale in our particle physics problem. Um, so apologies that the next slides are going to be a little bit equation heavy. Hopefully I'm going to talk you through them in a way that makes sense. Um, so what we're starting with on the first line here is a sort of toy version of the standard model. And now the phi, the scalar field in our action, is the Higgs field. So we've got a dynamical Higgs that has exactly the this, this standard Higgs potential here and it couples to our fermions in a way that gives the fermions their masses. So if we start with a theory, a modified gravity theory, where our scalar field, um, where we're working in the Jordan frame, so this is the action for matter and our scalar field is coupled to, to the Ricci scalar, to gravity, and then we change frame. We do a conformal rescaling of the metric as we've been talking about. Um, then our new scalar field, our cosmological scalar field that we're interested in, which we're now we're calling chi, um, will appear in all of these, these terms in the standard model. And they say, okay, that's a mess. Uh, I'm going to canonically normalize all of my fields to try and tidy things up. And it reduces to something, something that looks like this. And the key term that, that I want you to focus on is this one here. So this is the term the, the, which gives the, where the, the bare mass scale for the Higgs comes in. And we get a, a, a coupling through that term of our uh, cosmologically light scalar field to the, to the Higgs field. And in fact, it doesn't couple directly to the fermions. Now, if it doesn't couple directly to the fermions, which are our matter particles, you might think, oh, we're, we're saved. There's no direct coupling to matter, so there shouldn't be any fifth force between our scalar field and matter. But that's a little bit too quick because the, our, our cosmological scalar is talking to the Higgs and the Higgs talks to the matter field. So we have to be a little bit more careful than that. But that's okay. That's still a calculation we can do. And that mixing between our scalar and the Higgs just modifies the kind of diameter we were talking about earlier. So we've still got our S channel exchange between two, two fermions and they exchange, they, they can um, emit a Higgs. The Higgs can oscillate into our cosmological scalar, which can now travel large distances oscillate back into a Higgs, interact with our matter fermions and communicate a fifth force in that way. Okay, and That's a diagram you can compute. Uh, you go through, through the algebra and the important term is the last term in the last equation on the, at the bottom of the slide, which again has exactly the form that we've been talking about. There's a one over R term, that's our Newtonian-like um, interaction. There's an exponential suppression depending on the mass of our scalar. And then there's a mess of coupling constants out the front that control the strength of the force. Okay, so the key thing, the key point here, first of all, is that you can you can make your life horribly complicated and go through this messy calculation and come up with the same answer you could have done, you could have got from a simple calculation. So what was the point of, of doing that? The point of doing that was that everything is coming from this interaction with the Higgs, this term with the Higgs mass here. That's the one hard scale in our problem, okay? From, from the particle physics point of view, everything else emerges from that. So if we start with a scale invariant theory where the Higgs doesn't have a hard mass, where that mass term emerges spontaneously through some other spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanism, then we really do have no interaction between our cosmological scalar field and matter. So we really would have, in that case, no fifth force in our theory. And so that, that feels like, like a good goal because then we have a way of introducing, um, introducing light cosmologically interesting scalar fields in a way in which they don't cause fifth force and they don't cause us any problems for our experiments. And the only thing we, we have to do to get there is actually to go into the particle physics part of our model and modify a little bit what's going on in the Higgs sector and make it so that the Higgs doesn't have a hard mass, it emerges through some spontaneous symmetry breaking process. 
And in fact, you can go a little bit further than that and say, well, maybe the Higgs has some amount of hard mass and some spontaneously broken mass. Uh, and you can work through that and you can find, you find that um, are, are very good constraints on, on the behavior of gravity in the solar system. So in particular, our ability to track the position of the Cassini's gas lights tells you that if your light scalar field is coupling to matter with gravitational strength, so m in this term is the order m Planck, then you can, uh, at most 3% of your Higgs mass can be kind of hard scale. Everything else has to emerge um, spontaneously. So there's an interesting connection here, I think, between things you might want to do on the particle physics side, helping us with things we want to do for cosmology. Um, and there is certainly kind of some, some room here for one to tell us about what is possible with, with the other. So the question that I asked at the beginning of this section was, can we forbid our scalar field from coupling to matter? And what I've, what I've sort of talked you through here quite quickly is that yes, you can if you impose scale invariance. So if there are no hard scales in your problem, then you have no need to worry about fifth forces, but then you have to explain what is going on in, in your Higgs sector, okay? And you can have, you can generate, if you can generate the mass of the Higgs through spontaneous symmetry breaking, then everything is fine. However, and this is again, not our work, but work um, uh, which has a long history from others, that it's really challenging to preserve that scale invariance at the loop level um, or through renormalization, in which if we're, getting into the details of modifying our particle physics structure, then, then that we really, really need to be able to do. Um, so I think it's a little bit of an open question whether this mechanism really survives being embedded in, um, in a, a full quantum theory. There's certainly suggestions for how you do that. Uh, I think they're, they're still being understood whether those mechanisms work properly. The other last point that I want to make here before I move on to talking about screening, um, is, is one that I don't understand. So I'm throwing it out there in the hope that maybe somebody has some insight on what's going on here. Um, because the, the point I made from the start is that we have all of these different pictures of, um, of our scalar field, of our modified gravity, and um, physics shouldn't care which one we pick in order to do our calculation. We should get the same answers at the end of the day. However, that seems not to be the case here. Um, if we start with a scale invariant theory, uh, we do our conformal transformation um, so that the scale of, so our cosmological scalar field is interacting with matter, um, then, and then break the symmetry in our matter sector to get a Higgs mass. Um, that seems to give us a different answer to if we break the symmetry first and then do the conformal transformation. If we do the conformal transformation before we've broken the symmetry, we have no interaction with matter, and so we don't see the, the breaking of the symmetry. Um, and this is something that I think is, is still, we don't, we don't entirely understand why this matters and how to understand um, spontaneous breaking of symmetry and emergence of scales. And scales are obviously really important because all of the physics, all of the macroscopic physics that we see depends on there being scales in our universe, there being masses and length scales and characteristic sizes of things. And somehow it matters, it seems to matter how that emerges in, in, your, in your theory in a way which I haven't got to the bottom of. But if anyone has any ideas, I would be super interested to talk about them. Okay, so this is, that's everything I wanted to say about scalar variance. I guess before I move on to talking about screening, maybe I'll just see if there are any questions on any of that for the moment. Okay, it seems not to be the case, so I'll move on, but please, please shout if, if you have any questions. Okay, so casting our minds back again. Um, the other thing that we said when we were, we were worried about introducing these scalar fields and giving us unobservable, giving us fifth forces that we hadn't observed was that we were working with the very simplest scalar tensor theories that we could think of. Um, and generally, I guess, our um, philosophy in physics is if the simplest model doesn't work, well, maybe you need to, to think about the next simplest model. 
Um, and as soon as we go beyond the simplest models for scalar tensor theories, we have nonlinearities in the theory. And they change the game. Because as soon as you have nonlinearities, then you, you have um, interactions between what you think your background is and what you think your fluctuations are doing. So fluctuations are no longer independent of the background they're moving on. And that changes everything in a really, really interesting way. It gives us a huge amount of, of really cool phenomenology to go and explore. So you can classify that new behavior in a couple of different ways. You can think about it again at the level of kind of what is happening in my action. Um, how, does, how does this change the action for my scale? Um, and what you can do there is, is sort of there's three things you can modify. You can modify the mass of your scalar, so you can make it so that in some environments suddenly your scalar field, your cosmological scalar field, becomes really, really massive. Then it becomes hard to, to transmit your scalar field from one place to another, um, and maybe that's why it's, uh, our fifth forces haven't been seen, because we're, we're working in an environment in which the scalar field has become very massive. Or you could think about chain, modifying the way in which you couple to matter. So maybe you make it so that um, the coupling between your scalar field and your matter fields changes depending on the environment. And again, then if you can make that coupling weak in the environments in which you're doing your experiments, then everything is good because you have a natural reason for why you haven't seen it yet. Um, and the final thing you can do is modify the kinetic structure of your theory. Um, and that again makes it difficult for your scalar field to propagate and so it makes it difficult to transmit information with your scalar fields. And that again would explain why, why we haven't seen it already. Now at this point, this, this might sound really exotic and very Baroque and kind of why on earth would you do this? This, this, um, this sounds like completely crazy things for particles to do to change their masses. And I just want to, as an aside, um, say that it's not as strange as it might look at first glance. Actually, we know that this kind of behavior even happens um, in standard physics. So for example, in, electro, in electromagnetism, we have a concept of Debye screening where ele the electromagnetic forces are screened in a plasma because the photon picks up an effective mass that depends on the density of the of charges in the plasma. Um, and that's a very, very similar mechanism to our scalar field picking up a large mass um, what we're going to look at potentially is in dense environments. So um, this kind of behavior is actually the sort of emergent changes in masses, changes in coupling constants is something we already see in the physics that we, we know and, and study. So the other way of, of classifying screening is by thinking about its effects on, on kind of more macroscopic scales. So not thinking about what happens in the action, but thinking about what happens if I'm asking uh, about fifth forces around massive objects okay and there so again we yet again come back to our yukawa form for the fifth force and there's sort of two things you can change here um one is the way how does all of the mass of your object show up in this interaction um if uh for example it's actually only a shell of mass near the surface which is able to to source this uh, potential, then, then that's only a tiny fraction of the mass in your object. In your, so maybe it's only the surface of your planet or your star, which is sourcing your, your fifth force. That makes it much weaker than gravity and, and correspondingly hard to see. Um, and that's called the thin shell effect. And that's a common type of screening that we could see. The other, the other type of model is, is one in which uh, you don't um, you change the dependence on distance. So you don't just have the, the exponential Yukawa suppression and then the one over R term here. Um, but as you come close to the, the source that you're interested in, the matter, you change the way that this, um, this expression changes with distance and you make it weaker as you come closer to the object. So in this example, or in this sketch here, we've got a cluster and somewhere in some radius surrounding the cluster, we modify our theory, we modify the R dependence in a way that makes the interaction weaker. So um, test masses or test galaxies outside that radius would feel still the, the full um, fifth force, but inside that radius, you feel a much weaker, a weaker force. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about two examples um, of theories that screen, one which behaves in the first way, one in which behaves in the second way that I'm showing you on a slide. Um, and again, we're going to talk a little bit about how it's difficult to um, embed those theories in um, uh, to, to build good effective theories of those of those models. And I realise that I don't have a huge amount of time, but hopefully I can give you an idea of what's going on there. I'm going to skip that. So the, the first, okay, now I'm actually going to say one point on this slide, which is that what I've been telling you about here is that we're working with nonlinear theories. And as soon as we have nonlinear theories, we have higher order operators. Our theories don't have nice effective field, nice properties from the point of view of effective theory, field theory anymore. And we need to really worry about um, whether the theory that we're interested in is, is sensible, because if if whether the terms I've kept make sense or whether there are other terms that I should also have kept as well that would change the behavior that I'm, that I'm looking at. Okay, so the first theory I'm gonna tell you about is the, the Symmetron model. So this is a scalar field which has a potential which very much looks like the, the Higgs potential, but maybe we wanna pick different scales in here and has a coupling to matter. So T here is our matter energy and momentum tensor. Um, and we, uh, it's called the symmetron because uh, there are no linear terms in this potential or this coupling at all. So we have a reflection under a phi goes to minus phi symmetry. So out of that, we can build an effective potential which governs the dynamics of the theory. Um, and we give the matter some, some energy density rho. And then what happens is in high density environments, um, the field is trapped at the origin um, but as we lower the density and go to lower density environments, a uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking transition happens and the field picks up a VEB. And that turns out to be important because the forces our test particles feel because of the, the form of the coupling that we chose, um, that force goes like phi grad phi. Okay, so normally we think of forces going like the gradients of potentials, uh, but in this particular example, it goes like the gradient of phi squared. So in a dense enough environment uh, where our field is trapped at the origin, um, this pre-factor phi here is zero and we don't feel any fifth force. Okay, so there's no fifth force in a very dense environment, but you would see one in a diffuse one. And that's the way in which you can have cosmological effects in this theory without necessarily having um, uh, significant effects in, in experimental environments. Now, um, a few years ago with, with Ed Copeland, who I can see is actually on this call, um, and um, Pete Millington in Nottingham, um, we, we built a, a version of this theory where we know that we can keep the quantum corrections under control. Um, and it connects to what I've just been telling you because we actually start with a scale invariant model. We, have, we now have two fields that we're introducing on top of all of the standard model fields. Um, but we do, we, we introduce them in a scale invariant way. So there are no hard scales in, in the Lagrangian for our new fields. We minimally couple um, one of those fields to gravity with a phi squared term. This is motivated by our symmetron model. Um, and we compute the one loop effective potential. Uh, and at one loop, um, you do generate a more complicated potential for your scalar field. And you actually find that it has the kind of structure that we're looking for for the symmetry model that I've just showed you. So in high density environments, we restore the symmetry, the field wants to sit at the origin. In low density environments, you, you break that symmetry um, and the field wants to sit in a minimum with some non-zero bed. Okay, so it's, it's not exactly the symmetry model that I told you about before, but it has the same structure and the same behavior. And we can, be conf we can, we can check because of the way we've constructed this theory this, this potential emerges at one loop and we can check whether the higher order loop corrections are, are important or not. So that's what I'm showing you in this plot here. So this is the parameter space of our theory. So there's two parameters, one which is controlling the, the strength of the coupling to matter on the horizontal axis. Um, and one which you can either think of as the BEV in the vacuum, that's the uh, left-hand axis or the Compton wavelength of your field, which is the right-hand axis. Um, the blue region is excluded because we don't have this, we can't trust 
the theory from the, the point of view of quantum corrections, the quantum corrections uh, spoil the calculation that we're doing. Um, the green region is excluded because there are forces already weaker than Newtonian gravity and, and it's not interesting to have made our life more complicated for no reason. Um, and the grey region is excluded by um, solar system tests of, of gravity. So you can see there's still a reasonable window here of parameter space that is allowed, but there's certainly also a huge amount that is excluded. So we can build, so, so what we've done here is shown you that you can build theories of this type of screening, um, keeping all of the quantum corrections under control. That was the key thing that we wanted to do. Unfortunately though, what it looks like at least with this construction is that the consequence of that is you can only get of order centimeter scale Compton wavelengths. So that's obviously not a field which has interesting behavior on cosmological scale day. Okay. So that, that's not to say that, that you couldn't do better than we have done. Um, and we would certainly like to try and see if we can come up with a, with a, a theory that gives you even lighter scalar fields. I mean, centimeter scale Compton wavelengths are still light from a particle physics point of view, but they're certainly not light enough to be interesting for a cosmology. So I think it's still an open question whether you can build these types of models of screening in a way in which you can really do keep all of the quantum corrections under control out to cosmological scales. But um, certainly from the point of view of uh, laboratory experiments, centimeter scales are very interesting. And uh, the, so these types of, of scale theory could be, could be relevant for them. Okay, so in the final, um, I guess I've got five or 10 minutes. Is that right, Miguel? 12 minutes. 12 minutes, okay, perfect. I'll definitely finish in 12 minutes. Um, the final thing I want to tell you about, which I think is what uh, originally I was actually invited to, to talk about, so I definitely want to make sure I cover this, um, is some recent work where we've been looking instead at Galilean models of screening. And these are, these are the second type of theory that I, that I told you about where they screen the fifth force by changing the way the force depends on distance. So the, the Galilean is the theory um, where, uh, of, again, a scalar, a scalar tensor theory of gravity, where now we have a very complicated kinetic structure for our scalar fields. Um, so the, the first term here, the grad phi squared, would be the standard um, kinetic operator you would introduce for additional scalar field in your theory. But we also include these higher order terms as well. And the specific form of those higher order terms is chosen so that two things remain true. Firstly, that you have um, second equations of motion that result from this theory that are second order derivatives. Uh, you want that because you don't have to worry about ghost instabilities. Um, so you want to keep your theory stable and well behaved in that sense. Um, and the second thing that you want to ensure is that um, you have a symmetry of your theory. So we want um, the theory to be invariant under shifts of the field and shifts of the gradient of the field. Okay, so uh, it turns out that with those restrictions and working in flat space, and I'm still going to stick for the rest of this talk to working in flat space, um, that the, the, the number of terms that you can introduce is limited, um, and, and in fact limited to these um, four terms here. Now, since this theory was introduced in 2009, we've realized that this is actually quite a special version of this theory. And in fact, the terms we've introduced here are, are invariant under this symmetry um, in, a, in a particular way. They're only invariant up to, up to total derivative terms, which normally we can throw away because we don't think anything interesting is happening at the boundaries of our gravitational theory. But in fact, there are a whole bunch of other operators that you could write down that are invariant, other terms that you could write down in your Lagrangian that are invariant under this symmetry. Um, and so the, the theory has, has grown, has become Hondesky, beyond Hondesky, um, the host theories. Uh, so our understanding of what is the most general scalar tensor theory um, with or without this symmetry has, has evolved a lot over the last few years. But I'm going to stick for the moment to, to understanding theories that, that respect this symmetry. Because the advantage of this, this symmetry, again, from the point of view of thinking about quantum corrections to the theory, is the symmetry gives you a reason to keep some terms and not others. Um, and so you don't 
So you have a reason for saying I've kept these four terms and I'm not including um, a whole bunch, you know, other terms that don't respect the symmetry. Okay. Now the way that screening works in, in these theories is, as we said, that it changes the, the scaling of the, how, how the force scales with, with distance around our source. Um, so what you can see here in these three graphs are the first two are um, the scalar field profile around some massive source. Firstly, on a, a linear axis on the x-axis, then on a log axis. Um, and then the gradient of the field, so the strength of the force in the third plot, okay? Um, and if we look at, at the central plot for the moment, we can see the behavior of the field. So our field has a mass, so that means outside the Compton wavelength, which is the green vertical line, the field decays exponentially, okay? Inside that green line, as we're coming in from large distances towards our source, initially the field falls off as one as one over r, which is the kind of the type of force law, type of potential we've been talking about all the way through this talk. And then at some point, we come close enough that the gradients have become large enough that all of these higher order terms um, become important, our higher order kinetic terms. And they change the way that things are scaling. And the point at which that happens, which we indicate with the gray band, is called the Weinstein radius. And then the, the field starts to flatten off. Okay, so it's no longer got this, this sort of uh, one over R scaling, and the gradient becomes much, much flatter. In fact, on the central plot, it looks like it's become exactly flat. Um, the, the red dashed line here is the surface of our source. You can see on the rightmost plot, which is the gradient, um, that in fact, so this, the, there's a growing part outside the gray band where we've got a one over R, or one over R squared force, sorry. Inside the gray band, the, the, the gradient is much smaller. Okay. So that's the way in which you hide your fist forces um, and the way in which you would have avoided detection um, of the fist force in these theories because we live inside this, this Feinstein radius where the force is suppressed. Um, and again, you can ask how, how, sensible, how much can I build sensible versions of these theories um, from the point of view of quantum corrections? Um, and there was a very nice paper a few years ago by Duram, Melville, Tolly and Sue, uh, where they showed actually you could build a, a UV complete model. Um, so where, where you would have all of the physics contained in your theory. Um, and they did that again, as we've been seeing, by introducing another scalar field. So now pi is our Galilean field and H is a heavy field that we've introduced to help us build this UV complete theory. Um, so our, our Galilean field has a mass, so does our heavy field, so that's gonna be a much heavier mass scale. And then our heavy field and the Galilean field have some interactions. Um, and there's a, a, a particular nonlinear self-interaction term for our Higgs, for our heavy field here, not necessarily the Higgs, um, which if n equals three, this is a H to the four term. And again, we know that we haven't introduced any hard scales. We haven't introduced any non-renormalizable operators. So everything should be very well behaved here. And what we wanted to ask was, does the screening go through in the way that you expect in, in this UV complete theory, okay? And one of the ways um, that you might have gone about trying to understand that is to remove the heavy field from your theory. Say I'm working at energies that are much lower than the mass of this heavy field. I shouldn't have to worry about it. I should be able to assume that it's on shell. I can just substitute its equation of motion into my action, get a much more complicated action for my light scalar. So all I've done, all we've done going between the first and second equations here is to, to substitute, to, to compute the equation of motion for H and substitute that back into the theory. And I should be able to study this theory and this should tell me everything I wanna know about what's going on with my fifth force. And that, that is where you would go wrong. And that is where the interesting things happen uh, in this theory. Because if you do that and you ask again, what happens to the scalar force in my theory? Um, so just to set up what is going on here, we've got the, the force normalized to the Newtonian potential on the vertical axis um, and the distance outside our source, with well, the distance scaled to the size of our source on the horizontal axis, or so the surface of our source is the pinky purple vertical line here. Um, far away, 
from our source where the mass of our scalar field becomes important, we get the exponential suppression on the Yukawa term, that's fine. It's what's going on inside that which is complicated. Now, if we start with this low energy theory that is just about the light cosmological scalar, this has all the properties of being a Galilean theory, it respects our Galilean symmetry, it's got a complicated kinetic structure, so we would expect it to have screening like, um, like a Galilean theory typically does. And in fact, if you compute the behavior of this theory around some massive object, depending on the value of n that you're interested in, you get one of the colored dashed lines and you get this fall off of the strength of the force inside the Weinstein radius, as I've been telling you about, okay, as we talked about before. So this looks great. This looks exactly like a Galilean model with screening um, that we've, we, we said we were interested in, it, but we know it's got its origin in this more complete UV theory where we, we, we reintroduce the heavy field and that means we can understand of the quantum corrections and the theory and keep all of that very nicely under control. The problem is that if you don't do this intermediate step of getting rid of uh, or of the Higgs of the H field, sorry, I shouldn't keep calling it the Higgs, getting rid of your heavy field and substituting in its equation of motion, and you just compute what the two field theory does around your source, you get the solid black line. And you find in fact there is no suppression. Um, of the, the fifth force in that model, okay? So you're losing something when you're doing this process of, of removing the heavy field and actually in building what you thought was a UV complete version of a Galileo model, you've done that at the cost of losing the ability to screen um, the fifth forces that you wanted to remove in the first place. And the reason that this is happening, just to, just to in that sort of final slide explain what's going on, is that you've, you've neglected a bunch of higher order terms. The term that we kept here is, is the lowest order term in a series. And actually, as you, uh, if you compute what those higher order terms are doing, as you come in towards the surface of the source, the higher order terms become more important than the lower order terms. And actually, you should have kept the whole series of terms and they resum to what the, the full UV theory is doing, and that is not screening your fist force, okay? So what we have here again is a tension between having a theory with screening and, and having a, a theory that, that is well behaved from, from the point of view of uh, making it well behaved in the UV and keeping the quantum corrections under control. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sum up what I've tried to, to tell you about in the last 50 minutes. Um, I have tried to convince you that there are very good reasons to consider introducing light scalar fields into your theory, um, whether as modified modifications of gravity or as new particles in your matter sector. Um, but as soon as you do that, you have to explain why we haven't seen them yet in any of our experiments. Um, so there, I've talked about a couple of ways of doing that in this talk. It could be that you have a model with scale invariance. Um, it could be that you have a, a model with nonlinearities that give you these screening effects that suppress the dynamics of the scalar field. Um, but um, what, all of the examples that we've looked at, we always run into a problem of building good, robust um, theories from the point of view of keeping quantum corrections under control. And um, they're uh, I, I don't. I don't have a, a grand conclusion where I can tell you. I tell you that these two things are are not compatible. But I, so I guess my my final conclusion is that it's certainly difficult, and there's there's much more to be understood in terms of how to get the cosmological uh, and macroscopic behaviour that we want for for cosmology without uh, whilst at the same time having having a good robust theory that we understand fully um, from the quantum level up. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Claire. Very nice talk. So now there are a question. Is there any question, guys? Go ahead. Hi, Marco. Marco. Hi, Claire. This is Marco. Hi. So thanks for your talk, it was very nice. And um, 
I have a question related to the last part that you presented. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is basically if the mass of the Galileans plays some key role in, um, in the calculation that you did. Because, uh, of course, uh, the UV completion that you presented by Claudia and collaborators, uh, this is for a massive Galileans. So, mm -hmm. And the, the, the mass doesn't respect the Galileans symmetry, so it's not really a Galileans. Right. It's yeah. a proxy, let's say. And in, in that case, you show that the screening doesn't work. Do you expect the same for, uh, for, for massless, for Galileans, we don't have a UV completion, so we cannot check it so far. But do you expect the similar yeah. uh, behavior? It's a good question. Or um, there is some role Sorry, played by mass so that can change the, the, the outcome of, uh, of what you showed? Yeah, so I, I actually do think it's important for this theory that the, the Galilean field actually has a mass. Um, you, if, you, if you were to take this action that, that I'm showing at the top of the slide um, and try to estimate what you thought the Weinstein radius was, you would find that that's proportional to the mass of the Galilean. Um, so if the, the theory becomes massless, then it also looks like you don't, you don't get screening even in this effect, low energy effective version of the theory. So, you, so the fact that you've softly broken, and I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't say that yet, yeah, no, you're absolutely right that the mass for the light field softly breaks the Galilean symmetry. Um, that, that looks to be key um, in, in building this theory and in, in, in even hoping to be able to get some screening. Um, so to, to try and extrapolate out Obviously, we've only done the concrete calculations for the, the version that I've presented to you here. We've explored different values for the masses and, and couplings in the theory. Um, but to try and sort of make a more general statement than that becomes a little bit speculative. But I, um, what I would say is that I think these types of theories, um, which are not the original Galilean terms um, that I showed previously, um, I think they will all suffer from the same problem um, where whichever set of terms you keep, there are always higher order operators that you, you should have included. There's some evidence both from what we've seen and also in this um, earlier paper by Kurt Hinterbecker that those original Galilean operators, which um, he calls West Semino terms because of this, because they're only invariant under the symmetry up to a total derivative, that they're actually a special class and that they might still be better behaved in this way, that you might still be able to justify keeping those terms and, and not others. But certainly um, the more general set of Galilean terms, if you just require that they satisfy the symmetry, um, I think you will generically have this problem of, of not being able to neglect the higher order terms. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. More questions? I have a question. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I, first, uh, thanks for a nice talk. It was very clear. Uh, my question is also about the last part of the talk. So I was wondering whether you would expect similar behavior for theories that exhibit a different type of screening. I mean, I think, I think the answer is un unless you have a good reason otherwise, yes, generally you would, I mean, this is, this is not, this, this would be, should be a general rule of just studying anything as an effective theory that um, once you start keeping some higher order terms, you need a very good reason to keep those higher order terms and not all of the other infinite number of possibilities that you, you could write down. Um, so generically, yes, I think is, is the answer that once some higher order terms become important, you should expect the others to become important as well. And this is why you want to start kind of requiring that your theories have have symmetries which gives you a reason to keep some terms and not others um this so this is why for 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 a very long time people thought galileo models were the most interesting ones because they had this symmetry um one of the nice things i think we showed with our symmetron version of the model is that there is you can build a version of a symmetron which has an underlying symmetry which in that case was was a scale invariance and that again keeps things under control for you to a to a greater extent um, but unless you've got a reason like that, then yes, I think you generically do need to worry. 
Thanks. Is there any question? Mm -hmm. uh, I can ask a small one, ask a small about, uh, one. Other yeah. other questions. Uh, Claire, sorry. Uh, can I see this uh, result, uh, always the, the last one, uh, like a redressing of the, of the cutoff of the theory? So basically, you cannot trust anymore your EFT up to the, some naive cutoff that, uh, that, you, that you put over there, but it's just a redressing of the strong coupling scale of the EFT? Um, so you can understand it like that, but you don't even have to go as far as redressing, in fact. So um, if, uh, if we go back to here, the, the blue region is our Einstein radius. Um, and that is the, 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 the scale at which you would normally say, okay, my high order terms are becoming important. Maybe I should consider this the cutoff of my theory. That would be probably one of your first estimates for, for what you think your cutoff is. And, and in fact, we have this, um, as you said, uh, often we think about that's maybe too naive and actually you should think about redressing or rescaling that cutoff as you come in closer to, to the surface of your source. So you can see that the Weinstein radius here is about 10 to the three. And if we go to the other slide where we're talking about the higher order operators, you can see that, that far, far away from the source, actually the higher order terms, so like the, the red and the green are suppressed compared to the blue one, which was the first other term we wanted to keep. But as we come in closer and closer to the source, that flips and it flips exactly around 10 to the three. Okay, a little bit, actually a little bit outside. Um, so what I think, okay, again, within the subset of theories that we've been able to study numerically here, I think this is telling you that the Weinstein radius is actually a cutoff and you, you shouldn't be worried about redressing. It's just the theory fails at the Weinstein radius. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. Any question? So I don't think so. So thanks again, Claire. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for me. Your talk very nice. And okay, we can not clap, but virtually. <laughs> thanks a lot. And I, I would like to give an information for all before you leaving and you Claire as well. Uh, next week, uh, we have.